All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this problem. Let me go ahead and copy it up here. Uh, you guys probably saw some stuff like this on your, uh, through that lab that we did. I actually want to work on that problem too now that I'm thinking about it so you guys understand. So there are a couple things that can happen here. If we're going to show the, uh, I'd argue uh, you probably would have a very limited yield uh, because in order for a either a substitution or elimination to occur here uh, under basic conditions, uh, you're going to have to kick out an, an alkoxide group. And though they're actually stronger bases than hydroxides are, so it's actually going to favor the side that we're already on. If you're looking at equilibria, it's going to favor this side. Um, but let's just go ahead and say the SN2 is, is going to happen. Uh, we have to uh, figure out where it's going to attack. So we have a choice of this carbon or this carbon, because uh, essentially the oxygen is going to be our leaving group. So what do you guys think? The, the left carbon here attached to oxygen or the right one? Yeah, it's going to be the right one. So the first thing you want to think about is, uh, okay, is it going to be SN1 or SN2? And whether or not it's going to actually work or not. But I would say it's SN1, sorry, SN2. And the main reason why is because we have a pretty strong nucleophile here. We can't really use a substrate to predict that uh, just because we have a secondary spot and a primary spot. But I'm going to go ahead and say it's going to go like this. Knock out this one. And then here was our leaving group, this alkoxide, not the best leaving group. So as I was saying earlier, it, it's probably going to favor the reactants if you're looking at equilibria. Like that. <clears throat> Why did I not have it attack the left side if we're doing SN2? <coughs> it's a uh, secondary, secondary. So if, if they have a choice, it's going to tend to go less substituted because of the backside attack here. Um, you would have it go here if you were showing the formation of a carbocation. And, and I want to go ahead and show that now. So there was a question in the lab, I believe it was two weeks ago, and it had you guys uh, basically with an ether similar to this structure. I think it might have been a terbutyl instead, but it's fine. We can do this one. And the reaction with HBr, which I want to go ahead and show you guys now. Okay, and the first thing you want to do, uh, if you ever have an acid catalyst, you want to go ahead and show the protonation of something. And if there is an oxygen atom around, you're going, you want to protonate the oxygen atom. So go ahead and grab this. You guys remember why I want to protonate first? Make it a good leaving group, yes. Okay, so we get that, and now we have this. So now we have a couple of options on what can happen. Uh, we can show this going SN1 or SN2 at this point. And basically how I would show it go as an SN1 would be if I were to go ahead and have this leaving group leave on its own. And I want to go ahead and show both ways just so you guys can be able to predict uh, the both different ways here. So as an SN1, you want to go ahead and show the leaving group leave. So now we have a choice of breaking the left bond to carbon or breaking the right bond. Uh, we're not going to break the right bond here because this would result in, the, in a primary carbocation. This one would be secondary. So whichever one would give you the more substituted carbocation is what you want to go with. So go ahead and knock this out. Okay, so... I'm going to go ahead and say m minus that species for now. That's ethanol with our leaving group. We will definitely come back to that compound. Okay. We now have this carbocation. And then what you can show is bromine. Sorry, bromide ion. That's from earlier in the reaction, the H from the HBr. You can go ahead and show this acting as your nucleophile. All right, this part of the mechanism is definitely SN1. SN1, and then we go ahead and predict our product here. This is the bromine, like that. 
Okay, you can show another reaction uh, with the alcohol that left earlier. A uh, very similar reaction. So we're going to have to start with the protonation step uh, for the same reason as before, that we want this to become a good leaving group. So we go ahead and protonate the OH. Don't forget about this species. Students always forget this one. You want to jump the gun and kind of go to the next step already. Okay, so uh, we are going to get a bromine in place of where the alcohol is. And now what do you guys think? It's going to be SN1 or SN2? It's going to be SN2 and why? Well, we had the issue with, uh, what, if it's polar or protic, we said it was SN1. So do we, do we, have, to, do we, have, do we have to factor that into play here the, for this example? I'm trying to get the class's consensus on whether or not this is SN1 or SN2 for this next step here. Because it's like primary. Yes, that's exactly right. So uh, if you have a primary substrate, that takes priority over your solvent or nucleophile, all the jets below it. So you always want to go with the substrate structure first. So if you have a primary substrate like this is, it's going to go at, uh, SN2. Um, if you have, say, tertiary substrate, it's going to go SN1. So we go ahead and show the SN1 version of this, sorry, SN2 version. So the main difference here is uh, for SN1, we show the leaving group leave on its own. For SN2, you want to show the backside attack, and this is a concerted mechanism, meaning it's happening at once, like this. Um, if you were concerned with mass balance here, uh, what you could have shown instead was uh, the HBR. You could show that reacting with water to get hydronium, and then you could have generated hydronium later with the wad that left to remake it. All right. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, I want to go ahead and switch over to the packet. And I kind of want to crank through some of those problems. See if you guys are understanding this business. Um, hopefully, you guys have had a chance to work a little bit. Um, I do want to mention here while we're talking about it uh, if you're looking at the exam three step that's posted, it mentions the, the, the NMR packet is up. We are not even going to get close to that, I don't think. I'm thinking by, when is our exam anyway in this class? Uh, is it next week or the week after? Week after. Yeah, week after next. So I'm thinking we'll probably just have the main reactions done. We'll have probably SN1, SN2, E1, E2, and then likely additions as well. And that'll probably be enough for that exam. I'm thinking it's probably going to run right up to that. So there's no way we're going to get to NMR. <laughs> I'm not even sure why I haven't have it in there. I need to fix that because there's no way. All right, uh, first one here, I consider the reaction of 2-chloro-2-methyl pentane with sodium iodide. Um, for this one, I just want to mention here that you could be given this question without the structures because you guys do know how to name compounds now. And I'm also going to uh, assume that you remember your nomenclature from freshman chemistry. So you know that an iodide is an I minus without me explicitly telling you that. Everybody forgot their gen. <laughs> Everybody forgot their gen chem naming. <laughs> okay, hey, at least you're being honest. Okay, so looking at this one here, if you're, it's, it's basically talking about changing concentrations, and how does that affect the rate? The way you uh, need to approach these kind of problems is you first need the reaction rate, uh, rate law. So looking at the compounds here, I think the the first giveaway is the substrate. So you always want to go by the substrate first. And what do you guys think? That can be SN1 or SN2. SN1, and why do you think that? Yep, this is a tertiary substrate. Remember the substrate structure takes priority in determining whether it's SN1 or SN2. So this is SN1. So the corresponding rate law is equal to K times the concentration of the substrate. The reason why we do not include the nucleophile, which is your iodide here, uh, the reason why we don't include that in the rate law is because it's not part of the rate determining step. The only part that is part of the rate determining step is the substrate. 
And that, recall that that step was the step where the leading group left. All right. So here it's saying, once again, how would it affect the rate if one simultaneously doubled the concentration of both of these? So it, since this one's going to have no effect, it's just going to double the concentration. So it should double the rate. Um, if this were an SN2, just what if, uh, what do you think it would do to the rate then? It would quadruple it, yes. Okay, uh, while we're thinking about this here, uh, what do you guys think would be the side that equilibria would lie on? It, 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 so we did go over a little bit of acid-base chemistry. Um, here we have just the bases in there though. We don't have the acid compounds and it works out where it'll still follow the same kind of trend. And whichever side has the, the less reactive compounds will be the side where equilibria lies. So in this case here, so now we're looking at I and Cl. Uh, which one do you think is the better nucleophile? I minus is. And that's uh, mainly due to size. Uh, did you guys happen to get around to uh, how the different solvents affect these? The order flips if you're in aqueous solution. We'll get to that, but I'm, we're kind of splitting hairs at that point. But the main thing here is that uh, typically you want to go with larger uh, nucleophiles tend to be better nucleophiles when it comes to the halogens. All right, next question here. Uh, which combination of reagents is the least effective in generating sodium ethoxide? So this is actually what it fit really well with last exam. So you may notice here on all of these, it's ethanol as our choice to get our ethoxide here. And essentially what you need to do here is pick out the weakest base. The weakest base here will be the least effective. So here we have, NA, we have a hydride, we have an amide, we have a hydroxide, we have a carboanion here. So which one of those do you think is the weakest base? It's actually the OH. Yeah, OH is the weakest base. You guys know which one's the strongest base? Which one would be the best at doing this? So alkane uh, anions are the strongest bases we're going to uncover in this class. And that's actually what choice D would be. So if it asked you which one would be the best, that would have been choice D. Okay, uh, next one here. You guys probably have this mechanism in your lab manual, right? This is actually the same exact reaction we did in the lab two weeks ago. So this should be in your notebook already. So I, I don't want to replicate it here. I've also done it in class as well. So you should have it in your lecture notes and your lab notes. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Ooh, fun stuff here, mechanisms. <clears throat> so this question here looks like uh, being nice to the reader, so you don't have to actually draw all the compounds there, but you do have to draw the different arrows. So the first things first, uh, if you have an acid catalyst, you want to start with a protonation, and that's going to be on the OH here, so like that. Uh, this step here, uh, noticing uh, going from one step to the next, notice how water had left. So here the bleeding group leaves. So by showing it this way, showing the formation of a carbocation, we are showing as a monomolecular mechanism. And then the next part here, what do you guys think happened the next step here? Yep, methyl shift, like that. And then the last step here, uh, this is actually an E1 mechanism. So the E1 and the SN1 are very similar. The, only, uh, the main difference here is whether your nucleophile attacks or if it acts at the base. So here we're going to show it act at the base like that to give us our new double bond, like so. Okay. 
Next one here, not quite as straightforward, uh, but before we do that, do you guys have any questions about this one? So once again, it's talking you through here, we have an acid-base reaction first with the OH, and then you make a good leaving group here, that leaves, carbocation. Uh, whenever you have a carbocation, you want to consider the possibility of either a, a hydride or a alkyl shift. Here we showed a methyl shift, giving us a more stable carbocation, followed by the elimination step, giving us the rearranged carbocation product. Okay, uh, next one here. So it turns out that if you can have the formation of a ring that is five or six atoms large, you can have an intramolecular SN1 or SN2. And that's what's happening in this problem here. Um, based off my conditions here, I would say that since we are using this catalyst or this base compound, it's not part of this here at all. That's probably going to generate an alkoxide with this OH. So you may be thinking here, oh, why do we, why do we not have substitution happening instead? So here, I, you, you could argue that, okay, the amide ion can act as a nucleophile attacking here. But what we need to actually do is attack the H. So remember, um, last time I mentioned about acid-base reactions. So if you have this kind of a base, it cannot undergo an SN2 with this compound. Because acid-base will take priority. Acid-base is much easier to happen. So what's going to happen here is it will deprotonate. It'll act as a base, not as a nucleophile. So I'm just showing the, that OH bond breaking there. And we get Cl, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then O minus, like so. OK. And it's going to attack itself like this, knock out the leaving group. So th this is the tricky part when you're, uh, if you're not given the product here, uh, what you need to do is I recommend that you number everything. And I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go ahead and number it, number one from where the oxygen is at. So one, two, three, four, five. And what's actually happening here, if we put the numbers over here, one, two, three, four, five. So based off of this, what is the new bond? Oxygen to, oxygen to which one of these numbers here? It's to five. Yep. New bond right here. And this is a intramolecular SN2. A little inside scoop that intramolecular SN2s or intramolecular reactions in general have a tendency to show up in my chest because I like them for some reason. So be ready. Uh, so once again here, uh, these are favored. So what we have here, just talking about the compound itself here, is we have a nucleophile and electrophile in the same compound. So if that happens, you, you have a situation where they can react with itself, but you, it's, it's really limited. Uh, it only really happens if you're going to get a five or six membered ring. If the ring is too small, it has too much angle strain to get the ring to close. If it's too large or too far away from each other to even see each other. So it turns out that five and six membered rings are the, I, the, the sweet spot for getting these to actually react this way. Okay. Um, while we're on this topic here, I do want to uh, start a little page of notes here. I did want to talk about that reagent, and like, what if you wanted, what if you wanted to actually use it to make an amine? What would you do? And we're gonna have a few new reactions today to convert groups around. Where's my paper go? There it is. Okay. So it turns out that uh, SN2s typically use uh, strong nucleophiles. So 
So SN2 uses strong nucleophiles often. And if you recall, these are also strong bases in a lot of cases. So if you are wanting to run a reaction with an alcohol, you have to convert it first. So it turns out that alcohols typically undergo SN1 unless they are primary. Then they go SN2. So let me just get the point that I'm trying to do here. So what if we had this compound and I wanted to convert it to the corresponding amine? I would not be able to directly do this as a SN2 acidium amide because instead what will happen is an acid base. Because these happen a lot easier than a substitution would. So here, this is just going to do acid-base reaction, like that. And we're not any um, closer to getting to the compound where we want to have the NH2 there. So what we have to do instead is convert the leaving group into something else. And I'm going to go ahead and show you guys, uh, I think we'll do uh, two different ways today. I'll do maybe I want to show something early from OCHEM 2 yet. Yeah, like, oh, we'll wait till next semester. <laughs> All right, so uh, one thing you could do here is treat this with phosphorus tribromide. Here I'm naming it for you, right? Because you guys forgot, forgot your naming for Gen Chem. So phosphorus tribromide. And what this does, it converts any OH to a bromine. I do also want to mention here that um, this is a little side note. This is definitely an uh, OCHEM 2 reaction, but we use the same reagent again in that class. And it does the same thing in that class also. So any OH. Uh, we're gonna, it's going to be most useful for us in this class for doing it with alcohols here. All right. The other one uh, that would be useful in the same kind of situation here would be thionyl chloride. This is SOCl2. And it does a similar reaction like this. And same thing uh, we're going to see next semester where these also work like this. All right, so now we don't have to worry about acid base reactions at all, do we? We now have a good leaving group, we have a primary substrate. This is, uh, either one of these is going to readily react with the NaNH2 to give us the, the product of choice. So I'm going to go ahead and arbitrarily choose the bromine one and NaNH2, and that's going to give us the target, and that's going to happen via SN2. So if you want to go ahead and include the arrows here, oops, like so and giving us the product here. Interesting little story about uh, this compound right here. So uh, we did have an organic synthesis, research, organic synthesis research project going here about three years ago now, two year, more like two years. But anyway, um, we were trying to do this step here. And um, everywhere I've read, uh, people typically make this stuff fresh. Because apparently if you let it sit on the, on the shelf too long, it'll oxidize very, very, very readily. It's pretty reactive. So apparently uh, the way to make it fresh is to take uh, this red phosphorus and Br2 and you boil them together. And you guys know what red phosphorus can do if, if in the hands of students? <laughs> Kaboom. It's actually highly explosive. And I was reading at a certain school that actually have a lab that do make this stuff fresh. They actually have the, those students go through like a month long training on how to do it before they're left alone to do it. I was like, yeah, we're not going to get this stuff. <laughs> and we ended up just not even doing this, this reaction. We ended up changing our path of the project. Um, in hindsight, though, I think we should have just went ahead and ordered this one. This one, is, I've actually worked, worked with this one before. It's not too bad. You have to wear gloves. 
Um, anyway, I forgot to mention the name of this one here while I'm talking about it. This is thionyl chloride. And I'm going to go ahead and draw out the structure for this compound. Can you tell I'm teaching Lewis structures right now in 121? <laughs> <laughs> Trying it on my lone pairs? All right. Any questions about this stuff? All right. Go ahead and switch back to the worksheet. Got my little tangent out of the way there. It was relevant though. Okay. So next one here, uh, predict the SN2 product and I'm also asking for a mechanism. So I did specifically tell you SN2 product here and then see if we make any changes later. Uh, I'm going to add a little part here to the bottom after you do the A and B and basically how could we make this SN1 and what would, what would the difference be? All right, so SN2, uh, backside attack here. So you go ahead and show this compound like that. And I'm going to add a little comment here too. Uh, another way that this reagent is shown or these conditions, sometimes people will write sodium metal and ETOH is common, uh, another common way to show that. And the reason why people like to show it that way is because that's actually how we do this reaction in lab. Uh, you would take ethanol and you would just throw in metallic sodium and then you would throw in your substrate and then the reaction would go. All right, so not too bad here. So when you want to predict your products here, you go ahead and put the group on there in the same position. But now I want to put the inverted stereochemistry product. So I'm actually showing, next question is actually asking for the mechanism here. So I just want to show the transition state. I already did show the mechanism up above. This is, oh, this is the one you were asking about earlier? Okay. So we want to show the group coming in and the group leaving. So I like to put them in a straight line from each other. That kind of shows you how the inversion happens. And then OET is coming in and then bromine is leaving. Don't forget we need the brackets around the whole thing. Double dagger, because that's denoting that it's a transition state. So what? Yep. So we need partial charges there. So remember on partial charges, you don't want to ch uh, really show the ones that aren't changing. So technically this is the delta plus, but you don't want to show that because you want to just focus on what's changing here. So delta minus here, because it's going from being full negative to neutral, and then opposite direction for this one, it's going from being neutral to full negative. Okay. Um, next question here is asking you to draw the energy diagram, and you're assuming it's exothermic. Um, I do want to mention here that uh, it's technically the term you want to use here is exergonic. Um, exothermic is a pretty good uh, close approximation. If you recall back last semester, the major contributor delta, delta G is delta H. Delta S is, is a minor contributor unless you have like really high temperatures and then you have a huge impact from, from en entropy. Most of it's coming from the enthalpy which makes this term okay to use. All right, so it's basically asking you to do the plot you're doing last time. This was reaction coordinate and then delta G. And at the saying that it's exothermic, that means that, uh, which one's higher, reactants or products? Reactants. Yeah. Yep, reactants is higher, meaning it's coming down in energy, it's giving off energy, it's giving off heat. So a little bit lower, doesn't really matter how much lower, just enough we can tell. And how many bumps should I have? One. Just one, yep. So one bump, boop, like that. And then if you want to label things here, the double dagger goes on the top. And these are your reactants. 
These are your products. Okay. Bless you. Okay, so uh, suppose I wanted to run the same reaction now, but I wanted to do this under SN1 conditions for some reason. Okay. Why That's are we assuming an X or The question says that. <laughs> now, it's just, just ch checking if you know how it should go. So if it's, if it's endergonic, it's a higher, the products are higher. Extragonic, the products are lower. Okay. So. All right, so uh, once again here, I want to say that we want to run these reactions under SN1 conditions. How can I make this SN1? So let's go back, look at the original thing here. We are going to get a plus charge. It's going to change our product as well, as a result. But I'm looking at the conditions here. So I want to get, I want to run the same kind of reaction. I want to get this ether product, but I want to SN1. Yep. And but the thing about the conditions here, like uh, essentially, typically SN1s use weaker nucleophiles. And you would just have your alcohol as your nucleophile. So no, you wouldn't have this base in there. All right, so uh, I'll give myself enough room to do this from the bottom. So I want to go ahead and show this by SN1. And this, this, this can undergo SN1 because of the fact that it's secondary. So remember, the secondary was the in between the SN1 and the SN2. It can go either way. So this is going to pop off. As long as it's in a polar product solvent, which it is. And we get that. Now, is that going to go to the product? We have another, another step first. So every time you form a carbocation, you want to consider the possibility of something next door moving to make a more stable carbocation. So here I'm seeing, OK, if this, if this H jumped over, it would still be secondary. If this H jumped over, it would then be tertiary. So I'm going to go ahead and go with that. So here's our hydride shift that happens. You don't have this problem with SN2 because we don't even have a, we don't even have this intermediate to deal with. Okay. And then at this point, you could show ETOH attacking. And here's another intermediate that students will often forget. And that's where you have the extra H on there still. Don't forget about this step. So you still have the extra H there from the ethanol. And then I want to put my lone pairs in the plus charge. And then what do I do next? You want to deprotonate. All right, so a little bit of acid-base chemistry here. So if you think about what's in the water or what's in the solution right now, you have ethanol as your solvent. And it looks like there's some bromide floating around, too, from when the leading group left. So which one of them is more likely to grab the extra H, an ethanol or a bromide? Ethanol, why? So uh, bromides are actually the conjugate base of a very strong acid, where I would say the ethanol water kind of kind of more in the middle in terms of strength. So I would argue that ethanol would do this here. So you want to think about, uh, if, you're, if you want to show a deprotonation step, you want to think about what is your strongest basis in solution right now. And that, in this case, is ethanol. It is a stronger base than the bromide. So it's going to go ahead and grab this. What were we using, purple? Yep. Um, my point here is, in general, you don't want to show halogens deprotonating. Halogens are not really good for deprotonations because of the fact that they are the conjugate base of a strong acid. Next question here is, is this compound racemic? Yeah. The trick question is achiral. If it was chiral, it would have been racemic, but that is actually achiral. So you are on, thinking on the right track here. With SN1, this would be racemic if it's chiral, but it's not. So. Another way I've seen uh, these tricky questions come about is, uh, let, me, let me show you one of these examples I was thinking of. It's like it's purposely trying to trick the students. Huh? <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and take one that, let's go. Mm. 
let's say NH2. And then here, let's go ahead and put a BR. And let's just go ahead and suppose it's going to go SN1. And I want to show this. OK, so uh, here we have to think about, uh, we have two heteroatom groups. Um, which one will leave? Is it going to be the NH2 is going to leave, or is it going to be the bromine that leaves? Bromine, bromine leaves? Yep. Uh, this, is, this would actually leave the strong base. That's not good. This would leave the weak base. This is good. Remember that weak bases are good leaving groups. All right, and we now have a plus charge that is going to be a chiral center. And then we can show H2O come in and attack. Uh, for now, for the sake of discussion, I'm going to go ahead and draw this flat. So I'm not going to put a wedge or a dash there. And now we have to consider uh, what's going to deprotonate. It could be either an NH2 or it could be a water. Um, I would accept either one. Um, technically, the NH2 is the stronger base, but the water is in much greater abundance being the solvent. So it could be either one here. I'm going to show water because it's probably the more likely one. All right. Now we're into the part that I think is a really common trick I've seen with SN1s. And the question is, what is the relationship between the products here? Are they a pair of enantiomers? Are they unrelated? So I think the best way to approach this is to actually draw the both out. You might be first inclined to think, oh, the parts are scenic they're going to be enantiomers to each other. They are technically diastereomers because of the nether chiral center. Nothing's happening to the NH2 where the NH2 is at, right? So if you're being asked a question like this and you had a chiral center somewhere else that did not change, you want to go with diastereomers instead. So now you're getting a little insight into how the MCAT likes to do OCHEM. That, that, that question is actually from a practice MCAT that I'm thinking of. But you guys, you guys see that trick there? So uh, if you get a question like that, it's asking you if there are pairs of enantiomers, unrelated, blah, blah, blah. If there are any other chiral centers, once again, it's, they're diastereomers. But if that were the only chiral center, you would say that they're enantiomers, the racemic. And I would still say this is a racemic product here either way, but technically, they're diastereomers. All right. Oh, here's a question from my first year of teaching at, this, at CSN. I was told these questions like this were evil, so I no longer do them like this anymore. <laughs> so on both these questions, so I, I used to make the whole test this way, where you'd have a ton of multiple choice, and it was always like A through G, and there was more than one correct answer on all of them. But yes, I was told that I was evil on my reviews, so I stopped doing that. Like, I'm starting to agree that it, it probably was kind of mean, thinking back to it. <laughs> so, the way that, uh, on, on questions like this, I, I could potentially put something like this on a quiz though. I would not attest. Um, it, there's actually a couple of distinct questions here. So I think the best way to approach this one is to recognize the different sections here. So there's a question there with A, B, C. And there's also a question here between E and F. So you have three different factors to consider. All right, uh, which of the following applies here? So I want to think about what the product's going to be. So I want to go ahead and just draw the product here. Um, but what do you guys think, SN1 or SN2? So we, we run through the routine here. So you, uh, the first thing is substrate. It's secondary. Does that tell us anything about SN1 or SN2? No. no. You then want to think about the nucleophile. As well, and you can probably think about the solvent at this point too. We have a, is that a strong nucleophile or a weak one? So in general, if you, want, if you see something that, has, that is neutral, in general, those are weaker nucleophiles. So I would say that with, with that line of reasoning, the NH3 is a, is a weaker nucleophile compared to like NH2 minus. So 
So I would say that this is probably going to be an SN1 re a reaction. And what's also telling me that too is methanol is kind of a giveaway there as well. That's a polar product solvent. So SN1. So drawing the products here, this is going to be racemic. So one, two, three, four. And I'm going to use the little squiggly line there and NH2. And remember, we showed that to denote racemic. Okay. So it's saying here, uh, so these choices here, so one would be retention, one would be inversion, and then we have a little bit of both, which is what S and 1 gives. So C is the correct answer. All right, uh, next one here uh, is asking about rate law, basically, for both of these. If you want to make sure that we're doing everything correctly, a rate is equal to K times substrate. All right. So what about uh, D and E there? Which one is correct? Mm -hmm. E is the correct. So uh, NH3 is our nucleophile. That's going to have no effect on the rate. So ammonia does not affect the rate. All right, next one here. The concentration of alkyl bromide will affect the rate. So that's F. All right. Uh, next one is a similar question. Um, notable difference here, though, that is telling you that it's SN2, specifically. And next one here, um, X will react faster than Y, via, and then we have the other one here, Y is faster than X, and then both X and Y will react at approximately the same rate via SN2. What do you guys think? They are about the same rate. So. Uh, I think this, uh, these two traits were kind of, the, this one's intended to throw you off a little. It is secondary, and some would argue that this one would technically react a little bit faster because you have less H's over on this carbon to deal with, less steric hindrance, but honestly, they're both secondary. The main thing here, though, is that it's also allylic. Remember, allylic means it's one carbon away from, F from a double bond. So it's secondary, and it's allylic. The thing, though, is that allylic only really matters if you're forming a carbocation, right? So we don't have to worry about resonance here. There's no resonance stabilization here because this is not a carbocation. Because you're being told specifically it's SN2. So I would say that C is the correct answer. Um, the next one here, uh, this is asking about chirality. So it's D and E. The major SN2 products of both X and Y will be optically active. And the next one says only one of them will be optically active. What do you guys think? You're thinking it's one or both? One. Yeah, one. why is it one? Because the one changes when you get to the two colors, like from the bottom and then uh, the top. Yep, that's exactly right. So basically, this one's not even chiral. So it, you only have to worry about the chirality flipping if it's actually a chiral center. This compound is starting off a chiral. You're going to get an a chiral product. It's not going to all of a sudden become chiral. So this one is chiral. This will give you the inverted product. This one. You're technically going to get the inverted product, but it doesn't matter because it's achiral anyway. So this compound is achiral. So only one of them is going to give you a optically active product like that. Okay, uh, next one here. So this, uh, the next one here is dealing with the rate law. Uh, being that it's SN2, we have to include the nucleophile now in the rate law. And you could be a little bit more specific here. I'm just doing it being a little generic here, but you could draw in the compounds. Uh, the next part here, what do you guys think? It's F. It will affect the rate. All right, and then the next one is about solvent. So we have ethanol versus DMSO being an ideal solvent. Which one do you guys think? DMSO is a better solvent. Because SN2s prefer things that are polar and aprotic. Dimethyl sulfoxide is aprotic. 
ethanol is protic. Remember, protic means that it has acidic H's in it. So OH's, NH's, things like that. Dimethyl sulfoxide does not have any of that. All right. Um, next one here, uh, this one's actually similar to one we did earlier. Um, this is asking you to, uh, we're going to do a SN2 followed by an intramolecular SN2. So, and my hope is that you might recognize that it's excess there. So we have a ton of it there. So you could have one do an acid-base reaction. Uh, but honestly, when I put questions like that on the test, students typically do substitution at both positions. It's not really what I was looking for. But I can't mark it wrong because technically it's correct. So, <laughs> all right. So I want to go ahead and show SN2 here. So now I got to think about, okay, well, first things first, why am I thinking SN2? What's that? DMF. Solvent, DMF, that's dimethylformamide. I don't think I talked about what that one is. Uh, so DMF, let me go ahead and write it up the structure up here. It stands for dimethylformamide. So you got a, the formal group like that. And then you have two methyls coming off the amide group. Notice how it has no acidic H's in it. It's polar aprotic. Okay, so now we got it. Now we think it's, that's also a giveaway. Another giveaway is this compound is a stronger nucleophile, has a full negative on it. And then most importantly, the substrate has a primary center right here. So I think it's gonna do SN2 add to that carbon. Kick this guy out. And I want to go down below here because I want to do a mechanism. This next one here is not going to take much space anyway. Wait, the BR is here. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Look at. How many years later I took organic chemistry and I still have to count my carbons? Probably have you guys start getting into, right? Yeah. It's a habit you'll probably never grow out of either. I still count my carbons all the time. All right. So I would argue next here that instead of a uh, nether substitution, you could show an acid-base reaction between SH minus and this SH group here. So deprotonate, like so. So one, bromine's there, two, three, four, five, six, and then S minus is coming off. All right, and then don't forget about that branch group there. And then this is gonna do an intramolecular SN2 like that. The way you want to predict that is if you, you want to count the, the distance between the carbon that's being attacked and the nucleophilic atom. You want, if it's five or six, it'll work. So one, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to get a six-membered ring out of this. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the product box here. So six-membered ring. that. And then I like to highlight the new bond and kind of go from there to figure out the, the groups at, are at. So I'm going to, you could choose the new bond to be this one or this one. I'm arbitrarily choosing this one. So we have a carbon group. So this same carbon that has the new bond of sulfur. So basically this carbon is this carbon that has a methyl group on it. And that is, a, that is technically a chiral center. I didn't actually show it being chiral over here though, so that's my bad. But that should have been a chiral center also. And then it looks like here, uh, two carbons away we have a methyl group. So one, two, that. And I think we're done with that one. Okay, next one. Wait, Sorry, go ahead. Um, so to determine intra 
like the letter, like if it's going to become a, a ring, the number of carbons between which ones? So you, you, it's not necessarily carbons. You want to you want to count the distance between the electrophilic carbon and the nucleophilic atom in the molecule. If you get five or six atoms apart, you can get a ring to happen. Nature's going to prefer this because it actually, we're not going to really go into much detail with this, but ring structures actually have more, uh, less entropy than them, than the straight chains do. Stabilizing feature. All right. Uh, next one here, what do you guys think? Uh, SN1 or SN2? For the next one? So is the substrate telling enough? So it's primary, but it's also benzylic. So it could be either way. So the, the substrate is not telling us anything. Next step, next step. You have to go, go here. So I'm seeing here we have a weaker nucleophile, polar product solvent. I think it's SN1. And that's actually not the hard part of the question here, though. Um, the question here is basically trying to trick you with this one. This one is not going to react. That is on a sp2 carbon. For, for both SN1 and SN2, it has to be an sp3 carbon. So just ignore what's happening with the ring. Only chemistry is happening over here. This is meant to be a distractor. So this throws out this one, throws out this one automatically. And this one right here is violating the octet rule. So only answer it can be is A, but that is also the correct answer. So <laughs> that works out this way. So you're actually able to rule out everything except for the correct answer by noticing that no reaction at this carbon and this one violates the octet rule. That's actually a pretty normal thing I've seen on these standardized tests is a thing that violates the octet rule is a possible answer. All right, so A is the correct answer here. Okay, uh, next one here, uh, which of the following alkyl halides will react most rapidly in an SN2? Uh, so notice here how these are all kind of the same. They're all methyls. They will all work with an SN2 technically. Uh, the main thing that's different here is the leaving group. So which one do you think has the best leaving group? Yeah, but um, uh, how did acidity? How did how did acidity? Uh, it increased as we went down the table, right? So, yeah. What about so then? You know how the other ones were like um, on the last on the test that we just had, uh, and it was saying how um, we had two before me because it was like. Uh, yeah. You don't want the the short answer on the on the test that we just had. It's a little different here, it's happening here. Uh, here we're actually generating uh, these, these actual anions. You're thinking of like the hyperconjugation hyper effect when they're a couple atoms away. Yeah. It's a little bit different. All right, uh, next one here. So basically this question is asking you, uh, which one forms the most stable carbocation? It should be, so you want to think about, okay, if things leave, what will the carbocation look like? So this one is primary, this one here with the turkey foot, right? Or sorry, bird foot there. This one's primary, but it's also allylic. And then this one here is secondary. So I actually want to rank them in order, not just give the, correct, uh, the first correct answer. So which one, with that one is the most reactive. C is most reactive. Remember, you have, if that would give a carbocation there, we would have a plus charge, which would be stabilized by resonance. And then which one's next? B is next, followed by D. And then A would have no reaction. B at SN1. That would be an SN2 substrate. OK. So I want to go ahead and, oh, you can do this one. This is a fun one. All right, let's go ahead and do this one. 
And then I'm going to show you guys some elimination stuff today. I at least want to get us started today. We can't spend too much time on this. All right, uh, propose a mechanism. Do not show transition states. So the first thing you want to do in approaching these is which mechanism is it? So we have a poor leaving group. We have a great uh, acid catalyst. We also have a polar protic solvent, SN1. Um, I'm also noticing here that some kind of rearrangement thing happened. So we're actually going to have quite a few steps in the middle. Um, when you're first looking at this, it might not be uh, really apparent how it's going to go until you start getting a, a digging into it a little bit and actually starting the problem. So always start off with the protonation step. That is almost always the first step if you have an acid catalyst. All right, we now have an OH2+, plus, which is a great leaving group. So we can go ahead and have that leave. All right, and then right now this carbocation is secondary. Um, if I were to do a hydride shift from that one, it would be tertiary and allylic if I do that. So that's definitely going to happen. So this is going to jump over here. The motivating uh, feature behind this, what would drive these uh, hydride and alkyl shifts, is increased stability. If you are not getting increased stability from it, don't even bother with it because it doesn't happen then. All right. So I don't think this is going to uh, be the correct uh, carbocation that goes with the product, just because of the fact that look at where the new group is at. It is actually in this position. So in order to get to that product. We're going to have to do resonance here. So resonance. And then plus charge is now over here. All right. And notice here how we have an ether product and an alcohol solvent. So that tells me that methanol was the nucleophile here. So this is going to go ahead and attack. With meow, right? Sorry. <laughs> All right, and then we have the intermediate that a lot of students like to forget about. It's this one that has the extra H on it. And I'm going to go ahead and show a H2O that we had leave earlier. I think it left earlier here. So we can use this to deprotonate. All right, so a uh, little comment here about uh, the H2O is you don't want to just randomly bring in water molecules unless it actually kind of makes sense. So it only makes sense if it's actually part of your mixture or you had a water leaving group somewhere, then you can do it. Um, I, I know students have a tendency to kind of pull in water molecules out of thin air, and you're, you're in a, like a, a DMSL solvent or something. It makes no sense for water to be there. So don't uh, just pull water out of thin air just to make, make the reaction work out easier. All right, I want to go ahead and switch over to some paper now. I want to go ahead and show you some E2 stuff. Let me give you a little bit up there for a second for those that still need to copy it. That you, guys, you guys all work this packet already? Most of it? Hmm? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's the top part. So we're, we're done at this point. Uh, this part will be racemic also, right? Yep, so H3CO. So there you go. Same thing as above. All right, I wanted to show you guys the 
E2, we've, we've kind of done E1 already a little bit. Um, I want to just focus this last little part on the E2 mechanism. Um, but just before we have them all together in our notes, I will go ahead and do both of them, but then we'll spend the remainder of the time looking at the E2 for what little time we have left. All right, so eliminations. And I do want to mention here that these compete with substitution. And the way that these compete is they will they will compete with their corresponding uh, the molecularity on the reaction. So what I mean by that is the monomoleculars will compete with each other. So E1, SN1 will compete. And then the biomolecular ones will compete. SN2, E2. So, they, the, so you're not, you're not going to have a situation where basically E1 is competing with SN2. Does that make sense? They have to be kind of compatible. And you're going to see as you study that SN2s and E2s have similar conditions. Same thing with SN1 and E1. Uh, the main thing that's driving the difference is there are some structural features there, but a big one is temperature. All right, so anyway, the E2. So instead of having a nucleophile come in, we're going to have a base come in. So I'm going to draw our substrate out over here. And I'm going to put LG. And then we have some whatever generic groups coming off here. And I am drawing this in a very specific confirmation. Like that. Notice here how the H and the leaving group are pointing in opposite directions. Uh, we're going to see here today that that's how they have to uh, be to each other in order for the reaction to work. And we're going to have a base come in. So typically it has a negative on it. And we're going to, instead of getting the backside attack, we're going to instead get grabs H. That kicks that out. All right, so uh, draw the product here. And just to emphasize the fact that transition states can be for any reaction, not just any reaction, or not just specific reactions, any reaction. So I'm going to show the transition state for this reaction here. Um, B and H are going to make a new bond. The H and the carbon bond is going to break. This part didn't do anything. The, the single bond in between them didn't do anything. And then these groups didn't do anything either. But you are losing the bond to the LG. All right, double dagger. And then I want to go ahead and include my partial charges. The base will be delta minus. The leaving group is delta minus. Am, am I missing a dashed line anywhere here? between the, the two carbons, right? We're, we're going to get a alkene product. So we're going to show that forming. So there's your transition state. Um, notice here, if you, if you were to do the energy diagram for this, it would look just like the SN2. So they have similar energy diagrams also. All right. And then here we have, we're looking at mass balance here. We should have BH. And then LG now with the lone pair and the negative. I'm recording. I am not idle. All right. Um, the E1 is basically where it happens stepwise instead. So let's go ahead and use the same substrate again. Remember, we have a, sim a similar situation as the SN1. So here, we're going to go ahead and show the leaving group leave. Like that, on its own. We then generate a carbocation for the sake of discussion here. Let's make everything flat. That. We still have an H here. And then here is where your base comes in and grabs it. So that. New double bond, we're done. Okay, so there's your E1, there's your E2. 
So taking a look at the E2 reaction there, uh, as I mentioned here, notice how the H and the LG are in the plane of the paper. Um, if you were to draw the Newman projection, if you're hoping they're going away, I'm sure. So uh, I like to use Newman projections to explain this part. So I'm looking at it from the perspective from the left. That, put, that puts H on the vertical as well as the LG. And then you have your generic groups left and right. Okay. So in this orientation, H and the leading group are in the same plane. We can see that by looking at how this is drawn here. Notice how it's all on the flat part. That's in the plane of the paper. And what is the, uh, how are they related to each other in the Newman projection? Like are they, are they, are they eclipsed, anti, gauche? They're anti. So the term we use here is that the H and the leading group must be anti-periplanar, which means that they are in the same plane and they are anti to each other. So I'm going to put that little comment here. The H and LG must be anti-periplanar. No, that's just for E2 specifically. Oh. Um, it does not matter for the E1 because we have a carbocation intermediate. So it doesn't really know where it's at. So the carbocation makes that not valid anymore. All right, we are just about out of time. I want to make a, want to make a few comments here. Um, typically for um, E1 and E2, uh, you are going to go with the more substituted product. In most cases, is going to be the major product. So uh, let's do an example of that. So let's go ahead and say that we have a methyl group here. Actually, uh, I, I'm going to draw that flat for now. And we'll, we'll pick up the chiral version next time. But I just want to go ahead and draw it flat for now. And then here we have, say, like NaOH and heat. We need a leading group too. Oops. There we go. Sorry. All right. So uh, here, E2 product, major product would be more substituted product. And the less substituted product is minor. Okay. So. When I say uh, more substituted, that means the number of carbons coming off the double bond. So this one is major, this one is minor, and these also have additional names to them. So the major product, the more substituted product is referred to as the Vastev's product. I've seen some books write this guy's name out with an S, it's kind of spelled funny. They're actually writing his name out phonetically. This is how his name is actually spelled. It's Zaystev, but pronounces it with an S. This is the Hoffman product. You guys are going to hate Hoffman in OCHEM 2. He had like four reactions in that class. <laughs> but he did figure out a lot of stuff. All right, let's get a stopping point right here. That's next lecture. Oh. <laughs> uh, in, in general, it turns out where you get the more stable alkene as your product, and it works out for alkene stability. It's, it's similar to carbon cation stability, where the more substituted it is, the more favored it is. But so what we're going to see next time is we're going to go over the Zaystaff Hoffman products of the E2. It's going to be the focus of tomorrow's or sorry, Thursday's lecture. And as you can probably guess, there are ways that we can make one or the other favored. And you also have an extra consideration of if this is chiral, is the H actually anti to it? It has to actually be anti to it for it to work. So sometimes the the, the Zeta product can't even form because the H and the leaving group are not anti. But we'll see all the fun stereochemistry stuff tomorrow, or Thursday rather. So, all right.